After 100 years, the Klamath River is finally free. Or is it? Yeah, it's true. The three major dams in the Klamath River in Northern California have been removed, opening up 100 plus miles of habitat to spawning salmon. But there's also a lot of eh, misinformation being said right now about what this means for the environment and for the region. So now that the dam removal is complete, let's dive into what this means for the regional and local environment and what this might signal for future dam removal projects down the road. The Klamath River is thought of as a Northern California River, but it actually begins its journey in Southern Oregon, mostly from mountain runoff in the Cascade Mountains, including the area around Crater Lake. The Klamath is sometimes referred to as an upside down river. The Klamath River as we know it actually starts in a large agriculture area before crossing the mountains in deep forested canyons. The Klamath River begins as an outflow of Klamath Lake, surrounded by a quarter million acres of irrigated farmland. The Bureau of Reclamation pulls something like a third of the river out for flood irrigation. The majority of it runs off the land and right back into the river. This is a hugely productive part of the agriculture sector of California. And if this went away, it would be missed. It swings west across Northern California before plunging deep into canyons crossing the coastal mountain range. It makes a wide swing south deep into the Six Rivers National Forest before abruptly turning north again on its final march to the Pacific Ocean. Overall, this is one of the largest and most significant rivers on the West Coast. But like we said earlier, upside down, with the flat agriculture at the top and the deep mountain canyons at the bottom. All this area here is the prime spawning area for salmon whereas most of the agricultural pollution comes from this area. Oh, and to make matters worse, the river is naturally low on oxygen because of the algae infestation in Klamath Lake. It's perfectly natural, has nothing to do with pollution or runoff. You can zoom in and see it on Google Earth, just clear as day. This is the now demolished J.C. Boyle Dam, a relatively small structure built on top of an existing rapids or waterfall. It wasn't a storage reservoir or a high dam of any kind, but served as one half of a pretty clever hydropower operation. You see, right downstream from this dam site, the river plunged into a canyon and lost a lot of elevation. Instead of building a high dam further downstream, they diverted the river through this high-line canal, through a major tunnel, and down the hillside to this power station. From an ecology and resource management standpoint, this was a very good system. It used the minimum amount of resources to maximize the power output. Also, there's no giant dam blocking the canyon. Pretty clever for 1956. But this break in the river flow was an obvious blockage to migrating salmon. The river all but dried up between the upper reservoir and the power station. Now that would have been an environmental deal breaker, even for its time, if it wasn't for one detail. There was already another dam downstream that previously blocked all salmon migration. This was the Copco Dam, built way back in 1922 by the California Oregon Power Company. The original Copco Dam had a power plant built right into the abutment, and then just a few hundred yards downstream, a second diversion dam pushed the river into an underground tunnel where it exited downstream in a second power plant. Now for the 1920s, this was amazing. It was fresh on the heels of World War I, and power grids as we know them today didn't really exist. These two power stations from the California Oregon Power Company would have supplied power to any customer within about 100 miles or so, and would have been the only connection to reliable power available at that time. If it hadn't been for these two dams, this entire part of Northern California would have been without electrical power till at least the 1940s. So remember, the Upper Klamath was already blocked to salmon from 1922 onward. When J.C. Boyle Dam was constructed, it really didn't change much in terms of migration because it was on a part of the stream that was already blocked. But just downstream from the pair of Copco dams, there was was another deep canyon with an especially good elevation drop. Perfect place for a hydroelectric dam. And so the third and final dam in the Klamath was built just downstream at a place called Iron Gate. So from the 1950s onward, there was virtually no opportunity for salmon spawning in the upper Klamath. Basically from this point upward. But remember, the vast majority of salmon habitat in the Klamath was not blocked. And this is where the debate over the Klamath River dams really becomes nuanced. Because it wasn't just about the blocked salmon habitat. It was also about the downstream effects that these dams had on the flowing river. You see, water that's staying in a reservoir tends to heat up in the sun. As the temperature in the reservoir rises, the downstream temperature goes up with it. And so, reduced habitat as a result of the construction of these dams, higher water temperatures partially as a result of sitting in the reservoir for so long, an endemic algae problem which sucks the oxygen out of the river that's exacerbated by these dams, and you have a situation where it's really hard to be a migrating salmon on the Klamath River. And so enter the Yurok tribe who worked for decades to restore the salmon and see that the healthy ecosystems come back on the Klamath River. They were deeply involved in the activism that led to the decommission of these dams, and right now they have a lot to celebrate 
as the river is reconnected for the first time in over 100 years. At the beginning of 2024, the Pacific Core Utility Company began decommissioning its dams on the Klamath River, with a final piece of Iron Gate Dam finally being removed in August. So with the dams removed, what does this mean for the future of the Klamath River? Well, it means an additional 73 miles of river is available for spawning. Combined with access to tributaries, and you're looking at well over 100 miles of new habitat. It's unlikely that salmon will go above Klamath Lake in its current form, but that could change in the future. The Klamath River dams together produce about 161 megawatts of power, which is about enough energy to power the LA suburb of Garden Grove, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't seem all that hard to replace. But really it's all about perspective. Every region in the world needs access to clean, reliable energy. At one time, these dams provided the first power ever to this region of Northern California. And it's only because of the construction of a nationwide power grid that we can easily make up for it using other means. But every time you remove a reliable power station, you have to replace it with something else. And right now, these regions out west are heavily emphasizing wind and solar as replacements for hydro. And you won't find a single electrical engineer out there who will sign off on this approach. In reality, it all comes down to cost-benefit analysis. These dams were more or less one-trick horses. They didn't do major flood control, they didn't do major irrigation storage, and they didn't help transport any goods or materials on the river. They just produced hydropower. And so balancing the one benefit, hydropower, against the downside of the dams with ecology, and the owners of the dams made a pragmatic decision to decommission them. And only time will tell if this was the right decision. But there's something far more interesting going on here as the proponents of dam breaching are celebrating this recent victory. Brian Johnson from Trout Unlimited recently wrote, Along the way, we took inspiration from efforts to remove the dams on Washington's Elwha. I know the lessons learned in the Klamath have guide works in places like the Eel and the Lower Snake. Did you catch that? The Elwha, the Klamath, and the Lower Snake. Yeah, one of these things is not like the other. And you're going to see this kind of language used again and again in the coming months and years. The two dams removed on the Elwha River were over 100 years old and did nothing other than hydropower on a relatively small stream. Decommissioning these aging dams in favor of a free-flowing river makes a lot of sense. You could say something similar about the Klamath River. These were aging, small dams that really only fulfilled one function, which means that the benefits of removal outweigh the costs of seeing them go away. The Lower Snake River dams are giants of clean energy, in addition to the long list of other benefits they provide. They are not aging, they are not small, and they do not block salmon migration. Seeing this false equivalency put out there by people who say they're environmentalists worries me. Because if you care about the climate, if you care about pollution, if you care about the future of clean energy in the Pacific Northwest, you have to be in favor of the Snake River dams. Let's hope we can all walk in reality and make pragmatic decisions when it comes to our environment and our climate in the coming years. Thanks for watching.